，尊敬的教授们、尊敬的女士们、先生们、敬爱的同学们，你们好。呃，我今天能够在这里讲话，感到非常的高兴，而且非常的荣幸。所以，我想首先，我想感谢呃国际儒学学会，还有呃北京师范大学的哲学院。呃，因为他们邀请我做这个演讲，<咳>那我今天的演演讲的题目是“生生不息的中国、生命哲学、关系主义的伦理，以及十九冠状病毒病大流行”呃。嗯，但是因为我对这个演讲来说，我也邀请呃我们的斯洛文尼亚的一些呃中文的学生。来参加，来旁听，呃，所以主要的是因为他们，呃，我就决定我要用英文，呃，演讲，呃，但是为了使，嗯、呃，听懂我这个演讲的内容，对于中中国的同学们也比较容易，所以我就把这些黄灯片的内容翻译成中文，嗯、呃，所以我希望你们都能够。呃，听懂，听懂，或者至少听懂大概的意思，好吧？那我现在就开始讲，我就要开始用英文讲。谢谢大家。嗯、um, ，In this lecture, I will talk about the pandemic COVID-19, uh, which doubtless belongs to global scale crisis. Therefore, the whole of humanity should try should try to find a strategic solution. To this crisis, and to this end, the importance of intercultural dialogues manifests itself in a particularly clear and uh, unambiguous way. I'm namely convinced that, uh, of the fact that the intercultural dialogue agenda needs to play an important role in cultivating a new transcultural. Transcultural agreement, which might enable us to form new models of social cooperation and connections, not only within particular societies and cultures, but also across national, ethnic, and civilizational lines. So, therefore, it is by no means coincidental、uh, that the need for such a cross-cultural dialogue has become even more pronounced. During the global COVID-19 pandemics, so I will therefore、uh, try to outline some basic the theoretical groundworks、uh, for possible alternatives or alternative models、um, of social ethics from an intercultural perspective. And because I am, of course, a specialist in Chinese philosophy, I will naturally focus upon models that have emerged in China. In the Chinese tradition of ideas, in the hope of identifying some possible frameworks、uh, for a new mode of solidarity and cooperation that is crucial for the resolution of such crises, this task seems to me as a meaningful one. Among other issues, also in the light of the fact that in most areas of the so-called Semitic region, namely this is the region which was traditionally influenced by Chinese writing, Chinese culture, and especially Confucian culture. So,、uh, in the so-called Semitic region, this region, of course, of course, encompasses mainly Eastern Asia, but also Vietnam, for instance.、Uh, so, in this uh, region. Um, The pandemic has been brought under control、uh, much quicker and in a much more effective way than in other regions of the world. So, in this framework, I will first introduce the Chinese traditional Chinese philosophy of life and highlight its current relevance. In the second part of this speech, I will present traditional Chinese models of relational and、uh, anti-essentialist concept of the self. And finally, I will try to combine、um, these two characteristics, which are typical of traditional Chinese and especially、um, Confucian philosophy, and I will try to shed some light on some new ways of、um, understanding interpersonal and intercultural relations.
uh, or interactions that might help us uh, to develop um, new strategies against current and also possible future uh, pandemics. So I will start um, by highlighting the importance of a basic paradigm uh, which underlies the Confucian discourses from their very beginning, namely since the Book of Changes, Zhou Yi. Um, so this is the principle of creative creativity of life. Uh, sheng sheng. In my opinion, this vital creativity and the importance of human life that is, as we shall see in the following, implied in it, is of crucial importance uh, for the establishment of interpersonal empathy, which later manifested itself in the central Confucian virtue of humaneness, or Zhan. So such an interpersonal empathy, the feeling that other people and society is such, not only ourselves, are uh, important and that they matter is of crucial significance for in the period of any crisis, of any social crisis, especially the current pandemics that endangers innumerable lives throughout the, enti throughout the entire globe. So uh, let us take a closer look upon the basis of such a uh, view upon the importance of human life. Uh, as we can see in this second uh, quotation, which can, be find in the, which can be found in the Book of Changes, um, the Book of Changes pronounced emphasizes that creative creativity of life is what we call the change. And as we all know, the change is the basic paradigm of any existence uh, according to the book of uh, change, to the Zhou Yi. So, and um, yeah, one of, the, um, one of the modern philosophers, or maybe the crucial modern philosopher who has been elaborating upon this concept of the, uh, of the um, life philosophy is Fang Dong Mei. Um, Fang Dong Mei um, has, um, in the center of his philosophy lies the concept of life or of the living, Sheng, which is the basis of this Sheng Sheng Bushi uh, concept. Um, and it is derived, as already mentioned, from the Book of Changes. Um, and according to Fang, all schools of traditional Chinese a thought emerged from cosmology, which is defined by the all-prevailing instinct for life. So also survival, the vital impulse, impulse that constantly creates and recreates all that exists. This is the Shang Shang Bushi. Um, while the structural patterns, namely Li, of the of the um, everything that exists are fundamental, but there is also something else that is also very important, and these are the feelings, Qing. They represent the primary source of life, Shenmingda, Yuan Tai in Chinese. So he says that life is a world of feelings and its essence is a continuous creative desire and impulse. So for him, life is thus a flexible and extendable power. The universe is a living entity that cannot be reduced to mere inertial physical stuff. Based on these premises, Fang then added a third category to the dualism of matter and idea, namely the category of life. And he says, we can see that life is a novel, original phenomenon. And we cannot deal with it in the same way as with matter. Its system is predicated upon an organic wholeness. For him, or he emphasized that the universe, the living universe is full of energy also. And everything it, it, in it is structurally connected to the living process that penetrates the entire realm. Human thought is also rooted in this colorful, sensitive, and creative palette of life itself. 
It is not merely a product of rationality. He says, life is the root of the thought and thoughts are symbols or signs of life. Accordingly, even science is a symbol of the sentiments of life and its value life lies in developing the human desire of life. So Funk has completed the process of an ontologization of life. And he aims to fuse the objective world with the subjective spirit of humanity by the creative force of unceasing production and reproduction of life. This is this uh, aforementioned Sheng Sheng Bushi de Zhexie. So for him it is the driving, life is the driving force of the entire universe and for this reason he also calls it the original or the ultimate substance, Sheng Ming Wei Yuan Ti, of the universe. However he stresses that while this ultimate substance is transcendental, as we can see, Chao Yue, it is not so supremely unique as to be an absolute, Chao Jue. So it is Chao Yue, but it is not Chao Jue. Here we can see that his Fang's philosophy is still embedded into this modern Confucian uh, paradigm of immanent transcendence, which is uh, typical of the entire Chinese philosophy. So um, this life ontology of unceasing creative creativity was linked in his system, or he interprets the traditional Chinese Confucianism like, like that. This creative creativity was linked to the universal human feeling of mutual empathy which found its manifestation in the concept of humaneness, Ren. And this is a very crucial uh, concept in the Confucian philosophy, of course. And then this ontological dimension of humaneness was, that was rooted in the cosmic principle of creative creativity was already outlined in Jushi's Neo-Confucian theory. But in contemporary time, um, it was um, Chen Lai, Professor Chen Lai from Beijing University, was the first one who really um, meticulously elaborate upon this, and uh, he also thoroughly analyzes uh, this uh, ontologization of Ren, and on this, uh, which was developed by the Neo Confucian philosophy, and this has led him to the establishment of his own theory which can be called Ranja Banti Lun. This means the ontology of Ran. And let us take a closer look to this uh, kind of ontology of Ran that was um, developed by uh, Professor Chen Lai, who is um, currently uh, still teaching at the Beijing University, I think. So uh, he explains it in the following way. He says, I will read this, and the contemporary Chinese philosopher, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I will read this quotation, which is, um, which is um, uh, already written in Chinese here on this uh, slide. He says, the theory of humanness, in English translation, the theory of humanness was connected to the theory of creative creativity as a result of the reversal of the original mode of thinking. Namely, if the way of the humanness is universal, uh, the way of humaneness, sorry, is universal, if it is something which is not limited to the human world, then how does it manifest itself? Even in the earliest time, the Confucians believed that in the universe, humaneness manifests itself in the creative creativity of life. The cosmic creative creativity is actually humaneness, while the cosmic humaneness is the origin and the root of the humaneness of the human world. In other world, words, it is the, it, the substance. Humaneness is therefore in the sense, um, humaneness in the sense of human, um, interhuman empathy is thus 
obtaining a very elementary, very ontological um, dimension or character. Life in itself is what endangers people with meaning. The very fact that we are alive makes us human and also links us to our own humaneness, which is a part of us. So uh, let us now take a short look to another uh, interpretation of this uh, Chinese life philosophy and its, its, um, its connection to interhuman empathy or solidarity. Um, so this is the Chinese, uh, contemporary Chinese philosopher Li Zhe who is currently living in the States but is still an important Chinese philosopher. He also writes uh, a lot in Chinese still. So uh, he proceeds from one similar paradigm and this is his whole philosophy is based on the paradigm that the people are alive. And of course this sounds somehow a bit trivial, but uh, we have to um, say that he, his essential point here is the fact that the meaning of human life is not derived from that or from that what, which, which comes after it, as in Christianity or in all modern uh, Western, um, most of the modern Western ideologies, but from the life itself. He also, and he goes beyond that, he also asks himself, what is Actually, why or for what reason do human beings live? And this second dimension pertains to the relation between individual who is denoted as the small self, xiaoran, uh, uh, sorry, xiaowo, <laughs> and the society or communities in which people see a wider notion of themselves, namely the so-called great self, dawa. Xiaowa and Dawa, these two concept, concepts are, uh, of course, established uh, much earlier also uh, already in the Chinese history of thought. But Li Zhe also believes that the crucial difference between the Western and the ch traditional Chinese ethics lies in their respective views on the relation between the individual and society. He critically questions the Western system of ethics and moral philosophy which is rooted in the notion of individualism. So while the Western culture is therefore based on um, the idea of a free and abstract individual, the Chinese social order is grounded upon a network of relations and could be therefore denoted as a relational virtue ethic, guan xi zhu yi de mei de lun li. So this basic distinction leads to a great differences to great differences in the ethical top between the, these two uh, cultural spheres, not only concerning their respective views uh, on the relation between the individual and society, but also regarding the relation between reason and emotion. Li emphasizes the traditional Chinese societies were structured as networks of relations um, that bounded together individuals who were not constituted as independent and isolated entities, but rather as the so-called relational selves, which means that humans were essentially linked to each other or interrelated, and that their social relationships largely determined their identities. So Lee's highlighting such a concept of the human self, which is always situated in particular concrete situations and social settings is linked to the Chinese, especially, of course, the, uh, Confucian traditions, traditions, where conceptions of the person focus on relationships. This also implies that each person, uh, that each person's chosen, chosen pursuits, failures and achievements can only be understood under consideration of their interactions with the 
with others. According to Paul Ambrosio, this is um, in this way Confucianism amounts to a moral interpretation of relationships as the fundamental constituents of human life and morality. And now uh, let's take a look how does this Guanxi Chui, this relationalism look like according to Li home. So if we proceed from the uh, presumption that morality is rooted in the harmonious interplay between different persons embedded in various social roles, um, and if we call this relationalism, and this was in, in uh, Lizaho himself has, has uh, translated this, uh, that as Guanxiism, but which is not, uh, which doesn't work so well in English, so I prefer to call it uh, relationalism. So um, this Guanxi Jui relationalism is established on the basis of social relations instead of on the uh, foundation of individualism. So, and such understanding is a typical product of the Chinese, what he calls one world view. But this is an, an, another way for the holistic uh, nature of uh, traditional Chinese philosophy. And Li Zihou, um, Li Zihou, as we can see, this in this uh, quotation, he says, uh, because of the Confucian one worldview, people have cherished interpersonal relationships and earthly emotions even more. They were mourning the impermanent nature of life and death. Seeking for the meaning of their existence, they found it in the midst of their actual life among other people. In this way, they found innumerous in infinities within the finite, and they discovered that redemption can also be achieved in this world. Of course, all this is uh, intrinsically linked to the Confucian tradition, uh, which is based, uh, the ethics of which is based on the so-called five relationships, Wulun, uh, which are uh, very good described by Mencius, um, who um, who defined them as um, something um, that is um, based on uh, typical five five um, five modes of typical uh, relations, and this is this famous quotation uh, in which he says. Which means that, that there must be love between fathers and sons or parents and children, moral appropriateness um, between rulers and subordinates, difference between husbands and wives, and there must be presence of the old over the young and trust between the friends. So such a model or such a conception of interpersonal relationships, ethical order and mutual responsibility is rationalized, but it also includes emotions, which is also very um, important. So these basic relations roughly de define in which way interpersonal interaction should be carried out, because specific duties and behavioral patterns are assigned to each of them. This model can be viewed as a summary of the elementary human relations in any civic society, for it consists of the familial, the political, and the companion relationships. However, it also demonstrates the Confucian emphasis on the family, for as we can see, three of these five relationships are embedded or rooted in the family, in the clan. Moreover, as we can see from the above quotation, the Confucian system of these five basic relationships is not merely a description of our social relationships, but also a set of prescriptive norms regu regulating our social interactions. Because each relationship is governed by a virtue. 
This is quite important. And the most important um, virtue in this uh, sense is, of course, the virtue of family reverence, or some people are still uh, translated as filial, filial um, piety, as filial piety, sorry. So uh, this virtue, which is consti the constitutive element of the love from a child towards its parents, uh, is mostly seen as one of the cardinal virtues uh, in Confucian ethics. In concrete context, this mostly implies the fulfillment of filial obligations toward one's parents. Among other issues, uh, filial piety or family reverence is important because of the parent-child relationship provides the earliest social environment for a human being in which a child learns, learns to respond and to understand normativity in social relationships. So that's why virtue is cultured first and foremost within the family and within the constraints and duties that are uh, linked uh, to these kind of relationships. So the priority of family love over love for others outside the family, or we could also say the priority of closeness over distance, is therefore crucial to Confucian moral epistemology. It is in the family that one first and foremost learns of the life of virtue. The natural sympathy between parents and children established the human disposition of love. The love between parent and child constitutes the very ground of the fundamental human virtue of humaneness. It must be developed and cultivated, of course, to build a good society. So this virtue of Xiao represents a great potential for re-evaluating and um, reconstructing some of the modern institutions and ideas. Eric Klein, for instance, uh, exposes the, the strong uh, Confucian emphasis on the parent-children relation, relationships has much to offer in improving, reinforcing, and further developing the contemporary educational programs. So um, Confucian filial obligations include the obligation to respect and to obey one's parents. And this crucial virtue can be directly linked to the virtue of humaneness if it is cultivated enough. So um, in their book, um, in their book, um, Confucian Role Ethics, um, A Moral Vision for the 21st Century, Roger Ames, which you can see on this picture, and Henry uh, Rosemont also emphasize that family reverence, xiao, is the origin of virtuous social behavior and also the source of humaneness. The model that was denoted as relationalism, Guan Xi Zhui by Li Zhihou, they designated as the role ethics. They emphasized, namely, that it represented a network of social roles which originated from the roles of the members within one family. In such roles, people's lives are embedded into meaningful context. Besides, the network is dynamic and multi-layered. Uh, for no one is assuming only one role. So I am, for instance, I am a da daughter, but also a mother, and I'm a teacher, but also a researcher, which means that I'm also learning of other people, other people's uh, work. Then I am also a citizen, a wife, um, a driver, a consumer, a uh, rebel, a uh, singer, and so on. So the Confucian notion of person is constituted by a dynamic and manifold ethics uh, that is based on always specific relations. So they, uh, 
Roger Ames and Henry Rosen, um, Rosemont describe it in the following way. They say, Confucian role ethics has a holistic and compelling vision of the moral life that is grounded and is responsible to our um, empirical experience. First, Confucian role ethics uh, would insist on the primacy of vital relationships and would preclude any notion of final individuality. Personal discreteness is a conceptual abstract abstraction and strict autonomy a misleading fiction. Association is a fact. And what is, and then they say something which strives me uh, as especially important. They say, and giving up the notion of a superordinate self, far from surrendering one's personal uniqueness, in fact, enhances it. So now let us uh, take a look to this question of interpersonal uniqueness, because it is an important agenda when speaking about the relation between society and individual when speaking about democracy also. Uh, because many people think that uh, Chinese tradition was, or Confucianism was anti-democratical. Uh, and this is of course not true. But let us take a closer look upon its position within traditional Chinese philosophy. In the framework of the Confucian uh, relational morality, the moral ideal, which all individuals are striving for uh, is the achievement of the perfect moral self, Dao de Ziwa. However, in reality, uh, yeah, now uh, we have to ask ourselves whether such an ideal is something purely universal, are these moral selves or alike, or something that also allows for a uniqueness of a particular. Uh, individual existence. So, um, in the holistic system of classical Chinese philosophy, the moral self and a unique individual existence seems to be posited in mutual, um, mutual contradiction. If we look upon them from the Western um, point of view. But, as we will see in the following, in reality, they're actually parts of the same theoretical principle defining the complementary interactions of binary oppositions. So, the common Western arguments based on the belief that the Chinese notion of the self does not possess any strong individualistic connotations are for the most part too generalizing. Besides the Western notion of, the, uh, of an isolated, delimited, and completely independent individual is to a great extent also a product of uh, the ideologies of modernization. So when treating or exploring the Chinese um, notion of the self-realization of the self, we must proceed with due caution. For whoever has been socialized in the Euro-American uh, cultural uh, circle um, automatically tends to equate this term with the self-realization of an individual, of an individual existence. But in fact, the Confucian moral self can only be realized through and in his fellow people or through and uh, in the community. So David Hall and Roger Ames, yeah, David Hall and Roger Ames emphasize that the notion of individuality has two different uh, meanings. First, it refers to a particular uniform indivisible entity uh, which can, due to a certain feature, be included into a certain class or kind. As an element or a member of a certain kind or class, this individuality is actually interchangeable. This concept of individuality, on the other hand, underlies 
the equality of all individuals before the law. So the concept of, uh, and also uh, it underlies also the concept of human rights, equal access to opportunities, and so on. According to Hall and Ames, it is precisely this understanding uh, which underlies also the concept of freedom or autonomy, uh, equality, free will, and the like. This is the concept of, which is very universal, in fact, for um, such individuals are actually interchangeable. So this type of uh, self belongs to the domain of a one-dimensional empirical self. In Chinese um, tradition, we could call that uh, vaiva. But Holland Ames uh, point out that the notion of the individual can also be linked to the notions of uniqueness and singularity, which we can see on the second, uh, on the right side of this slide. Here, equality is posited on the basis of the parity principle. According to Holland Ames, it is this sense of unique individuality which enables us to understand the traditional Chinese notion of the self. So the traditional Chinese notion of the self is actually very, very uh, unique, um, as we will see. Let's go uh, back for a moment to Fang Dong Mei, who was also, um, who was also elaborating <coughs> on this notion. He emphasized that the uniqueness which underpins the Confucian self is already a value in itself. Tao is omnipresent for him. It uh, unites everything and, uh, but, and it is in this sense also somehow unlimited. But on the other hand, it also contains specific particularities. We have to accept the uniqueness of these particular entities as being true, says Fang Dongmei. Every particularity which has been realized bears in itself a tendency of value. Thus, its significance cannot be denied. However, even this kind of unique um, self and uh, single, the single self uh, must be understood in a typical Chinese, namely relational way, for it constitutes itself by means of the quality of its relations with the external world. So each of us has also unique relationships with, uh, with other people or with other objects of the uh, internal world. And this is also what makes us unique. So because of this domination of the individualism, there is a widespread prejudice also in the Western world regarding China and all other Sinitic regions. Uh, so uh, many philosophers of the West say that the so-called, um, or believe that the so-called Eastern people uh, are seen as lacking any individuality, as people who can only act and think collectively. But actually, collectivism is a notion which stands in direct opposition with individualism. It is, uh, it is a binary opposition to individualism, not to relationalism. Relationalism and the role ethics both represent a system in which people are aware that they cannot survive alone without each other and develop, therefore, a contextualized self-awareness. So if we try to find somebody in the Western tradition who uh, wrote something similar uh, to this um, relationalist uh, point of view, we can refer to Carl Gustav Jung's uh, concept of individuation, or even better, I would say. So uh, this is a kind of self-realization in the sense that each human self uh, is perceived as a unique, completely exceptional and um, inimitable 
combination of particular qualities that are as such universal. Universal and particular elements of each individual stand in a mutually uh, complementary um, um, relation. Because uh, we can think of it as each of us has two eyes, two ears, uh, two ears, one mouth and hair and two hands and two uh, four limbs and so on. But the combination, so, so this is universal. This is something that applies to all people. But the combination of all these things in a human face or body is, of course, unique. So the realization of the, this objective, of this individual, uh, individuation requires courage which uh, which is needed if you want to find out who we actually are so this is uh, this process is called individuation according to Jung and it is an ongoing psychological development um, that fulfills the individual qualities given it is a process by which a person becomes the definite and unique a human being which they actually or that they uh, who they indeed are. So in China and in other regions of the Semitic area, such a self-awareness is more realistic for precisely through his or her uniqueness, each human being can truly understand the meaning and the importance of social um, context in which they are embedded. And in, in such, through our uniqueness, each of us can also contribute to the uh, society. So the aim of individuation is to divest the self of the false wrappings uh, of the persona on the one hand and um, the suggestive the suggestive power of the unconsciousness on the other hand but uh, it is also something as we can see as we have seen which is very tightly connected to the meaning of human life so many contemporary scholars of ethics emphasize that the notion of individual is problematic this is also one of the reasons because of which leads hope pre prefers relationalism over individualism. So for him, a relational attitude and understanding is more accurate and closer to the reality than social theories which are based on the notion of an abstract individual. Because in the real world, there is no such thing as a completely independent or pure self, separated from all intentions, emotions, and relationships. Henry Rosmond and Roger Ames seems to agree, seem to agree with such a view, for they state that it increasingly seems to us that describing the proper performances of persons in their various roles and the appropriate attitude expressed in such roles in the relationships to others with whom they are engaged, suffice to articulate an ethic that seems to conform to our own everyday experience much better than those abstract accounts reflected in the writings of the heroes of Western moral philosophy, past and present. So in this context, we can also, uh, we can also look back to Lidze Hall because he states that the Confucian view of the origins and futures of humankind are more universal than comparably, comparable views uh, by major world religion, religions or world um, ideology that, the ideologies that are based on the notion of an isolated uh, individual. So Lee also criticizes such uh, Western discourses for their one-dimensional emphasis on individual autonomy uh, and the idea of free choice. Such paradigms ultimately rest on the underlying presumption according to which individuals can be separated and abstracted from social context, relationships, and even from such assets of human 
conditions that are vital for human life. For instance, from the ability and the need for interpersonal connectiveness and mutual care. From the perspective of Confucianism as uh, relationalism, however, humans are basically relational uh, existences. So he, he emphasizes that, that we don't belong only to ourselves, but we also belong to our, to our human environments because we are a part of them. So in a relational system, an individual is not expected to act as an, as an independent, detached moral agent. He or she is rarely judged according to an idealized standard of independent selfhood. Uh, in such an understanding of the self, relationships and environments largely determined individual values, thoughts, beliefs, and motivations, behaviors, and actions, and so on. Relationships in this framework are always uh, reciprocal uh, relationship, reciprocal, reciprocal, and uh, correlative, correlative. They are based on mutual complementarity. A good teacher and a good student can only emerge together. And your welfare and the welfare of your neighbor are contaminous and mutually entailing. So even though relationalism involves unequal rankings, for a ruler is the authority of a minister and the father is the authority of the son and so on, both persons involved in the relationships are still metaphysically and morally complementary to each other in order to form a profound uh, social unities composed by their relations. So relationalism also includes a type of virtue ethics, although this type of virtue ethics is not founded on the concept of an isolated individual. But rather, it is rather defined by the relationships, which are intrinsically emotional. So Lidaho also emphasized that in this system, it is important to cultivate these underlying emotions, which are rooted in biological instinct. It is important to link them to fundamental mutual obligations. This means that emotions have to be rationalized, ordered, standardized, and incorporated into a relationship, um, relational network within the human uh, emotional rational structure. So the, uh, the human mind, according to Lidze, how is a mixture of uh, emotion and, and reason, and he calls it emotion rational structure. So in this structure, relations are objective, while emotions and obliga obligations are subjective and must be differentiated. So uh, Lidze Ho also concludes uh, this part of his elaborations that, as we can clearly see, this type of ethics leads to harmony rather than to an abstract notion of uh, normative justice. So, of course, I will not go deeper here into the problematic uh, nature of the ideological misuse of the uh, concept of harmony, but um, I would like to conclude with the notion that such ideas, like uh, or such paradigms as relationalism, um, can stimulate a view of cooperation that uh, surpasses the gap between independent uh, singularity and uh, obliterated self. It challenges the dichotomies between the self and the other, or between the individual and the whole. This view is rooted in the paradigm of contrastive complementation because the distinct, 
because the distinctiveness of an individual uh, may be measured not simply in terms of their individual merit, but also in terms of the wider social impact. This, in turn, is evaluated according to the individual's position within his or her conceptual environment and his or her relations with other individuals. So from an ethical viewpoint, such a relational network has various significant social implications, particularly in comparison with the framework which postulates independent stability of individuals. So in a pe period of crisis in which COVID-19 is being spread throughout the entire planet, learning about different modes of cooperation and solidarity is of utmost importance. This short introduction of the traditional Chinese relational ethics, which doubtless, albeit in a um, latent and unconscious form, played a significant role in the process of the cinetic social responses to this crisis, is meant as a preliminary contribution to the forming of such mutual uh, transcultural learning, which is nowadays, nowadays more needed, but also, I would say, more possible than ever before. And with this, um, I would like to thank you for your patient listening and to uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you very much.